Ken Klippenstein is an independent journalist of great note, formerly of The Intercept, now freelance, and my goodness, is he breaking stories, one of which I alluded to earlier in my monologue. Ken Klippenstein joins us now from the United States. Ken, thanks uh, for joining us. Your latest story that I read uh, struck me as extremely important. The United States has rushed thousands of soldiers to Jordan. What could that be all about? Well, so the simple answer to that question is we don't know because the Biden administration has not articulated the reason for this. In fact, nobody noticed it until I uh, was going over a biannual, it's called a war powers report um, under U.S. law, an important check on the power of the um, president, which is obviously very powerful in the uh, U.S. government, ability to move troops. Um, one check on that uh, power is that they're supposed to uh, disclose to Congress the, the troop levels so that Congress can have some kind of a say. Um, they're supposed to be the ones that can uh, you know, authorize uh, uh, war plans, for example. And so in this biannual report, what I saw was not just a record number of uh, U.S. troops deployed to Jordan, but the highest increase um, in over that period of six months between each uh, war powers report that has ever existed going back to the Gulf War. So this is a you know very significant uh, buildup, and I can speculate as to the reasons. I know uh, based on people that I've spoken to that there are uh, you know there's a uh, there are covert uh, there is a covert presence there that's designed to um, assist the Israeli uh, military. Um, amid its uh, war. Uh, and so that's one part of it. Another part is that the U.S. is getting pushed out of Iraq. It might be uh, moving troops um, that had previously been stationed to Iraq um, there. But but your guess is as good as mine, because this White House has not made any comment of this uh, at all, and the media has not talked about it at all. And I'd encourage people to look at that uh, article that I wrote on my um, Substack about it, because th this is all open. You can read about it in the War Powers Report. None of this, I mean, I have sources, but none of this is based on uh, folks in the Pentagon. Um, this is just based on public, uh, publicly available reporting. Well, hiding something in plain sight is an old tactic, of course. Uh, very few take the trouble that you did uh, to crunch those numbers. There are at least three possibilities as to why they're there, aren't there? One is because they're expecting an Israeli invasion of Lebanon, uh, which may set off a general conflagration in the Levant. Uh, a second is that they're there for emergency use in uh, Israel. I'd be interested to know what your numbers told you about the American military presence in Israel and whether the purpose of these troops in Jordan is to protect the Hashemite uh, collaborator uh, regime uh, in the country because uh, Jordan is a country which comprises at least half of the population being Palestinian and about 15 to 20 percent of the population being Iraqis, uh, largely supporters of the former regime of Saddam Hussein. It's a very combustible place uh, with a British placeman uh, on an increasingly rocky throne. Uh, which of these three grabs you as the more likely? Well, based on people that I've talked to um, in the uh, defense and intelligence um, community, I know that there's some sort of um, special operations support, uh, which the Biden administration has acknowledged. Uh, they claim that this is only for hostage um, rescue operations. Um, we saw one of those go uh, very badly. I think got uh, 200 people killed um, recently. And so um, we do have uh, special operations forces, think uh, Delta, SEAL Team 6, assisting with that and providing intelligence support. The real question is whether it goes beyond that. My guess is it probably does, but that's that's what we know that the administration has has copped to. Um, you, you made another point about the U.S. military presence in Israel, which many Americans don't know about, and which the uh, White House has not been uh, candid about. They've never once um, acknowledged it, but we've for a long time had a number of uh, U.S. bases that provide um, munitions support, um, anti-air support involved in shooting down the Iranian drones and ballistic missiles launched at Israel, um, I think it was in April. So, you know, they have an extensive uh, presence there. And uh, w when I uh, did a story on this recently, I was shocked to find that one of the U.S. military units that had a public uh, 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 web official website 
um, describing their um, deployment there, you know, going back years, had been removed. They just took it down without explanation. And so for, I think for some of the reasons you described, the political combustibility of the um, U.S.'s um, involvement in, in Israel's war um, has made it very unpopular, um, not just in the region, but um, even to some extent uh, domestically here in the United States. And so for that reason, you've seen just the opposite of openness and, and transparency uh, with regard to the um, U- U.S.'s uh, role there, you know, as evidenced by that page that they just took down, you know, uh, uh, someone from the Defense Department reached out to me in response to a, a story I wrote pointing that out and showed me um, a timestamp showing that that page was taken down earlier this year. So that was taken down after um, the October 7th um, war began. So there's clearly from Jordan to Israel, um, a, you know, a huge motive on the part of the administration to not want to talk about um, what role it's playing in the conflict there. What naval assets uh, does the U.S. still have in the Eastern Mediterranean? I ask because everyone seems to think that Israel is about to invade Lebanon again. Uh, And uh, I think it's a commonplace that this time no more Mr. Nice Guy uh, on either side. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah made uh, really uh, very firm statements uh, earlier today. He spoke for well over an hour. Uh, he may still be speaking. I had to leave it. Uh, but the uh, likelihood of a major war between Lebanon and Israel uh, is likely to draw in any American uh, assets, either ground or naval. Yeah, so shortly after the war began, um, the U.S. military redirected uh, what's called a carrier strike group. Um, there's a small number of carriers. These are huge um, uh, naval ships that have uh, uh, fighter jets and aircraft um, that can operate from them. And that's part of why uh, Jordan is so significant is because they, in a, ha- the U.S. maintains a secret base there called the Muafik Salty Air Base from which they uh, can fly F-15s, F-16 fighter jets that have been involved in uh, striking these Iranian-backed uh, groups in Iraq, uh, Syria, and elsewhere. Um, but what these uh, carrier strike groups can do is provide even more air support than what they're able to do um, outside of Jordan, which because of uh, what are kind of euph- euphemistically called host nation sensitivities, the U.S. has to kind of uh, clear things with Jordan in order because of the um, you know political ramifications of running operations out of there. But what they can do from a, a carrier strike group is not have to worry about any of that because they're just operating in um, international waters. So they still have that strike group there. Um, stationed with all the assets that um, it involves. And they've used some of these assets uh, from strike groups uh, just recently, uh, targeting the Houthis, for example, in um, Yemen. Uh, but so, uh, and, and part of what's been interesting covering this is how little candor there's been on the part of the administration. I mean, they describe sending the strike group there, they describe surging troops there, but as to the numbers and specifics, they don't say any of it. And none of that is um, operational security. Uh, because you can deduce a lot of facts about the deployment of these units, as I've tried to do in my reporting, just from uh, open source records. So these are things people can know, uh, but which the Biden administration doesn't want the um, public to know for for whatever reason. When you compare that with the extraordinary amount of disclosure that they provide with regard to their support for the um, uh, Ukrainians, it's just night and day. I mean, they provide an entire itemized list of the weapon systems provided to the Ukrainians and details about um, U.S. and NATO support therein. You compare that to Israel, they don't talk about any of that. They don't disclose hardly any of the um, weapon systems that they're providing, or indeed the the uh, U.S. troops being, specifics about the U.S. troops being sent there. Now, notwithstanding the extraordinary level of support that we already know about, and now we know about, thanks to your reporting, still more, uh, Netanyahu knifed Joe Biden in the back in what effectively was a party political broadcast on behalf of Donald Trump. Uh, He attacked the U.S. administration uh, as not uh, a faithful friend, as having left them short uh, and uh, and dropped them in it by deliberate delays and obfuscations uh, to uh, the supply line. Uh, Were you surprised by that? I certainly wasn't. I knew that Biden would be stabbed by Netanyahu, but the Biden administration seems to have taken it rather badly. No, I wasn't surprised at all. I don't think I think many Americans uh, were not surprised. If there was anything I was surprised by, it was the fact that Biden was uh, seemed surprised by it. 
um, you know, they have this court reporter that is given all the White House exclusives, Barack Ravid, and within, you know, a couple of hours of um, uh, Netanyahu's extraordinary statement, which I encourage people to pull up and watch. I mean, how often do you see a U.S. partner like that speaking like that about <laughs> their elected leader that they're, you know, providing bi- uh, uh, billions in, in arms to? Um, but in any case, um, shortly after that, the the, the uh, there appeared a story in this um, Axios reporter who you know has very close relations with the White House, um, saying they've canceled a meeting with Netanyahu, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, conveying their uh, disgust with what happened. What happened, and, and you know, what I have to say, watching that is, wait, you guys didn't know this would happen? I mean, Netanyahu is not very quiet about his uh, disdain for the <laughs> for the Biden administration. So, sort of comical to to on both ends to watch this happen from the Israeli side, and then for the Biden administration to be surprised that it happened. Turning to matters closer to your home, at least, uh, Russian warships uh, looking at the twinkling lights of Miami this evening, uh, submarines, Russian submarines in Cuba, uh, the virtually certain deployment of long-range weapons uh, by Russia to Cuba. Uh, Once upon a time, this would have created quite a song and dance. I'm old enough to remember one. Uh, but it seems not to have frightened the horses at all. Why? Well, the Biden administration is juggling so many conflicts. It's, it's sort of uh, comical that uh, articulated in 2019 in the national um, defense strategy under the Trump administration was the um, you know a thematic statement that we need to focus on China now as the um, primary uh, antagonist or competitor, however you want to put it to the US. And now you look at, we're doubling down in the Middle East. Uh, we have, um, you know, uh, there's clearly a lot of concern about uh, Russian influence in Latin America generally. You just provided an, uh, uh, one example of it. And so, uh, and then we have Ukraine and it's kind of like, well, what happened to this prioritizing China? I mean, it, you know, uh, as, as strategists say, um, you know, if you do everything, you're doing nothing because you're not really focusing on everything. And that's what we have now. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, a shadow conflict with Iran and uh, various um, Iranian-backed groups throughout the region. Um, I mentioned uh, Ukraine, concerns about China and Africa. It's like, guys, pick one. And that's something you often hear when you talk to even some of the more hawkish elements within the Defense Department. They oppose um, uh, you know, turning back to US Central Command, that's the Middle East Combatant Command, uh, if only on the basis of, guys, we can't do everything. We can't, you know, we can't fight in every domain. We have to, we have to pick and choose what we want to, what we want to focus on. Finally, Ken, I know it's not your specialism, as everyone now knows that's watched this interview. It is foreign affairs and in particular military and security matters uh, in which you have few peers. Uh, But let me bowl what we call a googly at you. When you saw uh, Hillary Clinton in that extraordinary frock uh, on the stage at the Tonys with all the loveys uh, giving her a standing ovation, did you think you might be looking at the Democratic nominee in November against Donald Trump, the rematch of the century? I've gotten out of the predictions game. I think if I've learned anything from 2016, it's the um, futility of, of of making political predictions about what's going to happen. <laughs> but I'll, I'll say there's certainly a, a, a lack of enthusiasm, the likes of which I have never seen in this country before, not just um, for the um, incumbent uh, Joe Biden, but for Trump as well. I think there's a general and pervasive attitude that you know these are two um, you know, septuagenarians running against each other. We've already seen this episode. We just did this. Why are we doing this again? I mean, it is the the mood is like nothing I've ever seen before. It is just so um, demoralized. Ken Klippenstein, thanks very much for your wisdom. It's been a pleasure talking with you this evening. Uh, Ken, uh, well worth following, well worth reading, I promise you.